Hey everyone, Sin here. Welcome back to another project video. It's been a busy year here at Sync, and I hope you enjoy the new intro and outro animations and logo design. I'll be experimenting with the project format this year, so let me know how you like it in the comments. I'll be breaking up the project videos into two parts. The first which shows a project overview and results, and the second which will go over how to write the code step by step. In this video, I'm going to show you how to control a pan and tilt servo configuration in LabVIEW, with a laser pointer sprinkled in for fun, creating a LabVIEW controllable laser turret. And as part of this, we will get a brief introduction on how to use event structures. And in the following video, I will show you how to write this code in LabVIEW step by step. For the servos, I'm not going to go into great detail on the background theory on how they work. There are plenty of resources for that, including my earlier videos linked on screen and down below. I'm also not going to go into how to wire up the laser diode, as I'm assuming if you already don't know how to do this, then you shouldn't be playing with lasers. Lasers are a serious eye hazard, and you risk permanent eye damage if you do not wear the proper personal protective equipment. Now that we have the warnings out of the way, we will briefly go over the video structure. First, we will go over the parts and circuit schematic. Then as usual, we will write some test code in the Arduino IDE to confirm our circuit. And lastly, we will bring it all into LabVIEW using the Lynx Toolkit, which has now been renamed the Hobbyist Toolkit. For the LabVIEW section, we are going to achieve two control methods. The first, a very simple manual control setup where we control each axis separately using numeric slide controls. And the second, a more advanced method of control by tracking mouse position and using the keyboard directional arrows as inputs to determine the servo position. In this project, I am using a two axis pan and tilt configuration with a pair of MG996R servos that I picked up off eBay. You can just as easily 3D print the pan and tilt brackets if you have access to a 3D printer. With this configuration, we will be able to pan along the X axis to the left and right and tilt up and down along the Y axis, covering a 180 degree range of motion for each axis. The circuit schematic is straightforward and is as follows. Connect the 5 volt power input wire of each servo to the 5 volt rail of your power supply. For me, this is the servo red wire. Next, connect the ground wire of each servo to the ground rail of your power supply. For me, this is the servo brown wire. Please also make sure your Arduino is also connected to the ground rail of the power supply so you have a common ground across the circuit. Next, connect the signal pins of each servo, the orange wire in my case, to a PWM enabled pin of the Arduino. As we will be using the duty cycle of the PWM signal to adjust the server position, in this case I am utilizing pins 5 and 6. For a full list of PWM enabled pins, consult the Arduino website or pause the video and take note as seen on screen. And lastly, power your Arduino by connecting it to your PC via the USB cable. Now you're ready to upload some code. However, before we move on to the code, I just want to discuss the issues that can arise if you do not properly power your servos from an external power supply and instead use the Arduino 5V header, which will cause your circuit to experience a brownout reset. A brownout will occur because the servos will load the Arduino 5V rail, causing a significant drop in the power reaching the microcontroller, resulting in a reset. A quick demonstration is shown on screen. When I run the LabVIEW code and move the servo, a timeout occurs because the Arduino has reset and lost communication with LabVIEW. So if this is happening to you, use an external power supply for your servos. You also must ensure the power supply you use is capable of providing the servos rated stall and operational currents, if you expect to utilize the full payload capabilities of the servos. To determine this, consult the data sheets for your servos. For these servos, the stall current is 2.5 amps and the operational current is 1 amp. So a power supply rated to a minimum of 2 amps is recommended, but 5 amps is preferred. And as you can see on screen, the current drawn by the servos easily exceeds the 40 millivolt 5 volt rail of the Arduino, even for basic movement of only one servo. Now we have wired everything up, 
Let's test this configuration out by uploading a simple Arduino sketch. The Arduino code is pretty simple. We just want to test the servos are panning and tilting for their full range of motion and thus confirm our circuit is working as intended. First we include the relevant libraries for the servos, servo.h, so we can call the relevant servo functions. So make sure you have installed this library in the IDE you are using, using its library manager. Just ignore the Arduino library call as this is only needed if we're using the VS Code IDE. You only need to call the server header file in the Arduino IDE. Next we define our server objects for both the pan and tilt servos. Using these objects we assign the relevant pins on the Arduino, pin 5 for the pan servo and pin 6 for the tilt servo. Then we just initialize the default servo positions to be 90 degrees. Now we cycle three for loops to pan and tilt the servos. The first two loops will increment a counter from 1 to 179 with a 50 millisecond delay between each loop iteration. This represents the range of motion of 1 to 179 degrees for the pan and tilt servos respectively. The third for loop will cycle the pan servo in the opposite direction of the tilt servo simultaneously. This way you can see them working together. So once you've uploaded and tested this to confirm everything is working as intended, we can move on to lab view. Before we take a look at the VIs, make sure you upload the correct firmware to your microcontroller platform using the hobbyist or Lynx firmware wizard in LabVIEW. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay. I will go over how to do this in detail in part 2, as well as how to write each VI we go over here. The first VI we are going to use is quite straightforward. We define the servo channel in a numeric array, then using numeric slide controls, with set values in the range of the acceptable pulse widths, we're able to control the servo positions. Looking at the block diagram, starting on the left, we initialize the error cluster with a constant value and pass the Arduino COM port to the OpenVI to initialize the visa session. We then take the device name output and display it in our string indicator. This is to give us an OK that the connection to the Arduino was successful. Then we specify the servo channels we are going to be using in the numeric array and pass this reference to the servo open, set pulse width and close servo functions. And finally, we pass the numeric slider value into an array by using the build array function, which is then passed to the set servo pulse width function, which allows us to set the servo positions. And that's pretty much it. Now we can control our servos. Oh, and don't forget to wire your error cluster and stop button to the loop condition. This is to make sure it stops when you want it to, or if there's an error in the VI. Let's see this VI in action. The second VI is just an extension of the first VI. In fact, it is based on the first VI, with the major addition being the event structure in the while loop. So this is what I will focus on, as the ancillary functions are the same as the first VI. In LabVIEW, you can use the event structure to handle events in an application, such as a key press or a value change of a control. As with the case structure, 
you can add multiple cases to the event structure, which can then be configured to handle one or more events. Such as the first event case in this VI, which handles two events. These are the value changes of either the pan or tilt numeric slide control. When those events occur, LabVIEW will execute the corresponding case. Starting with the default event as mentioned above, this event case will handle the event of a value change in either the pan or tilt numeric slide control. When this occurs, this case will execute and write the current values of the numeric slide controls into a pulse width array, setting the survey positions. Just note here the use of a shift register to keep track of the pulse width array values. After an event occurs, the current value of the pulse width array is passed to the shift register on the right. This value is then passed from the left shift register in the next loop iteration to whichever case executes next. This way, the servers will always remember their last position. Also note, I have initialized the shift register with some values on the right. So when the first loop iteration occurs, the servers will default to that position until the pulse width array is updated. The next case is pretty straightforward. If the stop button is pressed, it will set the loop condition value to true and stop the while loop. Cases two and three are the cases that will handle the event that a key on your keyboard is pressed down. Don't worry, I will discuss in part two on how to add all the cases to the event structure. So as mentioned, if a key is pressed down, this case will execute and output the key pressed from the vkey event data node. This value is sent to a simple case structure, which handles what to do next. If the keys are anything other than up, down, left, or right, it will do nothing as the default case suggests. If the up or down directional keys are pressed, it will tilt up or down by a pulse width value of 50 milliseconds. If the left or right directional keys are pressed, it will pan left or right by a pulse width value of 50 milliseconds. And that's pretty much it. We can now control our servos through the directional arrow keys on our keyboard. The following event case does exactly the same thing, except it handles the event of a key repeat. That is, if a key is held down continuously instead of being pressed once. This way, you can move the servo smoothly in a direction without repeatedly pressing the directional arrows to increment the servo position by 50 milliseconds. The final case is the most complex. Here we are tracking the mouse cursor position over a 2D picture control, which I have used as a nice canvas for the front panel. This is a bit more complicated because we have to map the mouse cursor position to a pulse width value position. This mapping is handled in my sub VI, and as you can see, it's a bit of fun maths. All we are doing is using a linear fit to map the cursor position to a pulse width array value for the corresponding axis. If you are interested in learning more about this, make sure you stick around for part two. And that's it. Through the magic of maths, we can now control the survey position with our mouse cursor. That concludes part one of the LabVIEW laser turret project. Stick around for part two, where I will go into detail on how to write each VI and explain the logic behind it in a bit more detail. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please make sure you subscribe and hit the like button. See you in the next part.